Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second session of God Passes By. We had a fantastic session a couple of days ago. But before we start, ladies and gentlemen, um, something I like to do, I like to just look at, uh, look at some things. One of them being, there's a couple of uh, quotes I've got about people. And I want to see if, uh, if, if we know who these are about. So this is actually from what we've read. So the question is, who is preeminent in holiness, awesome in the majesty of his strength and power, unapproachable in the transcendent brightness of his glory? The Bab? Baha'u'llah. No, Baha'u'llah. Who are we sticking with, with Baha'u'llah? Baha'u'llah indeed is the answer. Yes, Baha'u'llah Baha is that. Um, next one, who is this? Mysterious in his essence, unique in his station, Astoundingly potent in both the charm and strength of his character. Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha. The Bab. Abdul Baha. The Bab. We've got a mixture. Abdul Baha. Abdul Baha. Oh. It is. The Bab. It the is. Bob. Most, it is most definitely Abdul Baha. Most definitely Abdul, Abdul Baha. Baha. Yeah, it isn't. There we are. Okay, superb. Who is this one about? Behold him. Endowed with the most perfect appearance. Supreme capacity, absolute perfection, consummate power, and unsurpassed might. His face will shine with a radiance that illumines all the horizons of the world. Shoggy Effendi. Baha'u'llah. Shoggy Effendi, Baha'u'llah. Um, Cynthia simply laughs. <laughs> like um. The Bab. Very good. It is indeed Shoggy Effendi. This is about Shoggy Effendi. Um, Stop showing off, Nabu. The, the most <laughs> <laughs> finally, everybody, apart from Nabil, who is irresistible, matchless in his meekness, imperturbable in his serenity, and magnetic in his utterance. The Bob. The Bob. We all seem uh, pretty pretty confident on this one. Unfortunately. You're right, ladies and gentlemen, it is the Bab. Very good, yes. Matchless in his meekness, imperturbable in his serenity, and magnetic in his utterance. And this is what we're looking at the, when we're going into God Passes By. The first period deals primarily with none other than His Holiness, the Bab. Um, so I usually like to give a slight overview of, of uh, things, we've, things we've studied. And we looked at the, uh, the introductory pages of God Passes By. Um, and in it, uh, Shoghi Effendi says that he's going to give a, an, an overview, um, a kind of overview of, of the salient points that, that happened within this uh, first hundred years. Remember, it was written in uh, 1944, so it covers the period 1844 to 1944. That's the hundred year period that, that we're talking about. And it covers all three um, epochs of the heroic age. So you'll see here we have the first, uh, which is the Ministry of the Bab, the Ministry of Baha'u'llah, the Ministry of Abdul Baha, and then it goes on for this last thing. Um, which is about the the covenant of Abdul Baha, basically once um, Abdul Baha passed away, and and how the covenant of it grows and the institutions and the rest of it. So these are the four periods uh, that essentially that essentially we're looking at. And in the introduction, it, it discussed how uh, the environment that um, the Bab had basically entered, that Iran at the time, like many countries around the world, um, was full of corruption. As people, if they wanted to do good, they couldn't do good. We're talking through the ecclesiastical orders, um, through the, the sovereigns, the rest of it. The whole country was actually just full of corruption, unfortunately. Um, and this is the, this is the terrain that, that the, Bab was, the Bab was walking. But he came and he came basically to make everything new, to almost tear everything down, turn it around, make everything brand new and uh, release, uh, release these reverberating energies, these vibrations across the world, which arguably we're, we're definitely feeling today. Um, then uh, the Guardian talks a little bit about how it, how it seems that from this small shaky sect, because remember... Our story starts with Sheikh Ahmad and Saad Kazim. It's crazy how from this small shaky sect that this idea that grew, that actually turned into something that actually spread all the way um, from Iceland to the Magdalenas, which I believe is in, in Argentina. So he's talking about the scope of it. Then the Guardian talks about this thing as a sublime drama. And I know Nabil, I think Nabil's counted the amount of times the word drama. Nabil, how many times did the word drama appear in the Dawnbreakers? I don't have the, the, the number on my fingertips, but I think it's in the dozens. I think maybe 30, 40 times. Okay, all right, there we are. So, so this is how much we're talking about. This whole thing is a drama. It's a sublime drama. And then he also explains that they're not also in isolation. These things are all joined together. They're knit together with each 
little episode revolving and, and connecting to the rest of it. We then go on to learn that there are going to be four periods, essentially, that we're talking about. And these periods, you know, you can see them um, on this, on this, uh, what's in front of you, these different epochs. And basically the first period that we're talking about is the period 1844 to 1853. And it's talking about the Bab, and it starts with the declaration of the Bab. Um, it kicks us off with that. It then talks about this veritable orgy of religious massacre. Um, then, we, then we hear about, you, you know, so a lot of the Babis are killed once the Bab actually reveals who he is. Uh, then, then the Guardian talks about how we went through two sovereigns of the Gajai dynasty. So we had uh, the first king, Muhammad Shah, and Muhammad Shah's prime minister was Haji Mirza Agassi. Then um, after him, we went to Nasruddin Shah and Mirza Taki Khan. And then we just learn about the hostility of the masses against the Babis, the tortures that took place, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the horrible things that happened. Moving on from that, we went into the second period. The second period is dealing with uh, Baha'u'llah, um, 1853 to 1892. And it starts off with Baha'u'llah receiving his revelation in the Siyah Chal, and then talks about the proclamations to the kings and the ecclesiastical leaders that, that Baha'u'llah talks about. And then it ends with his death in Bahji near Akka. The third period was the uh, period of Abdul Baha, which was from 1892 uh, to 1921, as you can see down here, the dates are here. Um, and it starts with the announcement of this covenant of Baha'u'llah for the first time as to, in his handwriting as to who Abdul Baha is and, and, and the covenant. And then as a result of this, absolutely transforming, we, we see that the light that spread through Europe, Australasia, the Far East, North America, and obviously Abdul Baha traveling to North America and to Europe, it culminates obviously in, in the passing of Abdul Baha. So we've got about 30 years, um, roughly, that, that that period lasts for. And then we have the final, uh, the final uh, period, which relates to the forces relating to the will and testament. There was a brief overview about the, the bar being in the, in the two prisons and the, the, the horrible uh, attacks against him. We then learned um, a little bit about Mullah Hussein and the declaration that took place. So we, we learned how uh, Mullah Hussein went to the bar, that the surah of Yusuf, um, uh, part of that was, was revealed to him. I, I believe it was the surah of Mulk, the first chapter of the, uh, um, oh, sorry, the, the, the Gayom al -Azma, which is the, the Gayom al -Azma is the surah of Joseph, um, which maybe later on I'll get Dr. Fanana Pazir to expand on a little bit. This, this very weighty text, twice the size of the Quran, um, which, which was one of the two things that a lot of the early Babis had, actually. They had the Gayom al -Azma, and they had the prayers of the Bab. These were the first things that the, Bab, the Babis had. So we, have, so we have these two things. So we realize that Mullah Hussein, he finds the Bab, he loses his mind eventually when he sees this, absolutely like he's crazy. The Bab says to him, don't go out. Um, then, we, then we had a little snippet from the, uh, what the Bab said to the Letters of the Living, because we found out that the Letters of Living, the 18 came and the first to believe in him. We touched slightly upon Godus. We mentioned Godus being the moon of guidance, which is such a beautiful title, um, because when the Bab was in prison, Godus was out and just like in the, at night time, where does the light come from? It comes from the moon, which is reflected from the sun. I guess the bar being like the sun, and Godus being that, that luminary uh, light. Um, so we talked a bit about Godus. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, Tahere, um, the beautiful Tahere and, and, and the power that she brought. And finally, we ended up learning a little bit um, about how Mullah Hussein was told to go and spread the word. Um, and he was also told that he would meet this, this treasure, this treasure in, of Mazandaran which we then know to be Baha'u'llah. That pretty much gives us an overview of, of what we've covered. Um, so there's a few more details that, that we went into and, you know, Mullah Hussein was told that um, the mystery, here it says, beautiful, the mystery that he was seeing would transcend the light shed by both Hijaz and Shiraz. So Hijaz obviously being the area that encompasses Mecca and Medina, referring to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Shiraz referring to the Ba'a. So this is all things that are going to come. Remember the time, 1844, there was a lot of excitement. People are believing that the, the return of Imam Mehdi, the, the Ga'em, is, is about to happen. Some people are really searching for it. Some people like playing with the ideas. But there we are. That brings us up to date. Are there any comments or questions, as a great man once said? Any comments or questions that anyone wants to uh, say anything before we continue? It seems like not. Somebody, a beautiful soul, still has their microphone on. So again, if you could, if you can kill that. We also have Mr. Chad Jones in the building, which is who's a, a 
a very knowledgeable man to say the least. Um, somebody who inspired me to get into this whole thing. So welcome to Chad as well. So anyway, welcome to all of you people. Um, we're going to kick off and who would like to start us off and uh, start reading as we carry on uh, with this story. Um, and just briefly before we do so, um, you'll see here there's the word Varhead. And I touched on this last time, that Varhead um, has the meaning of unity. And uh, I very lightly I touched upon this, this thing called the Abjad system, where letters have values, A is one, B equals two, so on and so forth. So with the word Varhead, you have um, a value of 19. And this is why we have the bar plus the 18 letters of the living, because together they make 19. So this number 19 comes up a lot. We know it comes up in our um, months and the days in our months and, and all the rest of it. And the, the Apostles of Baha'u'llah, it comes up again and again and again. So, so there we are. That's what we're going to be talking about. So uh, if I can ask our first, re I'll ask Nadine, actually, if you'd be our first reader, please. If you'd kick us off with this uh, from galvanized into action. Thank you. Galvanized into action by the mandate conferred upon them, launched on their perilous and revolutionizing mission, these lesser luminaries who, together with the Bab, constitute the first Vahed unity of the dispensation of the Bayan, scattered far and wide through the provinces of their native land, where with the matchless heroism they resisted the savage and concerted onslaught of the forces arrayed against them and immortalized their faith by their own exploits and those of their co-religionists, raising thereby a tumult that convulsed their country and sent its echoes reverberating as far as the capitals of the Western Europe. It was not until, however, the Bab had received the eagerly anticipated letter of Mullah Hussein, his trusted and beloved lieutenant, communicating the joyful tidings of his interview with Baha'u'llah, that he decided to undertake his long and arduous pilgrimage to the tombs of his ancestors. In the month of Shaban of the year 1260 AH, September 1844, he who, both on his father's and mother's side, was of the seed of the illustrious Fatimi, and he who was a descendant of the Imam Hussein, the most eminent among the lawful successor of the Prophet of Islam, proceeded in fulfillment of Islamic traditions to visit the Kaaba. He embarked from Bushir on the 19th of Ramadan, October 1844, on a sailing vessel accompanied by Kudus, whom he was assiduously preparing for the assumption of his future office. Landing at Jadi after a stormy voyage of over a month's duration, he donned on the pilgrim's garb, mounted a camel and set out for Mecca arriving on the 1st of Dil Haji, December 12. Kudus, holding the bridle in his hand, accompanied his master on foot to that holy shrine. On the day of Arafi, the prophet pilgrim of Shiraz, his chronicle relates, devoted his whole time to prayer. On the day of Nar, he proceeded to Munna, where he sacrificed, according to custom, 19 lambs, nine in his own name, seven in the name of Kudus, and three in the name of the Ethiopian servant who attended him. He afterwards, in company with the other pilgrims, encompassed the Kaaba and performed the rites prescribed for the pilgrimage. And this is obviously dealing with the story that's, that's within the dawn breakers. Um, that His Holiness the Bab, he turned around and he said he, he sent the letters of the living out and he, he sent them all out to go across Iran to, to spread the news and um, essentially, uh, yeah, to spread the message uh, that, that, was, that had just taken place, that this declaration had happened. Now, now, what ends up happening is he says to them all, I will not go on pilgrimage until 361 souls have declared. And this number might seem a bit arbitrary, but then we, we know we spoke about this number 19 earlier on. And if you have 19 times 19, that's 361. 361 also is the abjad value of this word kulashe. Kulashe means encompassing all things. 
Um, so again, th this system that's been used, this abjad system, um, which is very heavily used in the Quran and, uh, and in the Torah as well, actually, um, this is something that, that the, the numerology sort of really made sense to a lot of people. And it said 361 people have to believe. Um, as they were going out, um, Mullah Hussain was, uh, was one person who traveled up from Shiraz here. He went to Isfahan, Kasham, Gom, and to Tehran. While he was in Tehran, um, he then goes to, to one of these schools and he starts sharing the message of the coming of the Bab. The main person in charge wasn't interested. Mullah Hussain retreats. And then one of the students, a name, someone by the name of Mullah Mualem, comes and says to Mullah Hussain, what is this? You're telling me that the Mehdi's arrived, the promised one is right? And then Mullah Hussain shares with him. He then starts asking about somebody uh, who lives in this family, somebody from Noor, and starts asking questions. Does he have any children? And Mullah Mualem says, yes, I know his children. And there's, and there's someone who uh, cheers the disconsolate and, and feeds the poor and, and all the rest of it. And Mullah Hussain says, I want you to go and give this scroll to him. Go and deliver this to him. So he gives the scroll and no one knows to this day what was in that scroll. He goes and takes it to him, gives it to him, knocks at the door and the, uh, the brother of um, this, this son opens the door. Um, uh, this is Baha'u'llah we're talking about, his brother, Agaya Kalim, Mirza Musa, opens the door, uh, welcome, welcomes him in. The scroll is then given to Baha'u'llah who takes one look at it, says to his brother, what do you think of this? Before his brother can respond, he says this is assuredly the same truth as that of from the Quran this text right here. So Baha'u'llah we're talking about um, is the one who's now accepted and says, yes, this is true. Mullah, he then gives some, a loaf of Russian sugar and some tea um, to Mullah Malam to go and give to Mullah Hussein. He comes back, gives it to Mullah Hussein. Mullah Hussein is ecstatic. He's absolutely ecstatic. He then he, he, uh, gets really excited and then he goes back and he um, transfers this, uh, this knowledge to the uh, maternal uncle of the Bab, who's in Shiraz, who's the one who's going to be taking all the, all the details in. When the Bab finds out that Baha'u'llah is on board, and at this time he wasn't revealed as Baha'u'llah, but when he finds out, it's at this point, the Bab says, now I will go on pilgrimage. And even if I were to fail in everything I do, Baha'u'llah will take off. And, and he's, just, he's just totally, totally cool about that. He then goes on his pilgrimage um, from uh, Bandar Bushir, Bandar meaning port, uh, which is over here. He goes on his boat, they travel around, um, and whilst on the boat, the conditions were horrendous, people were arguing with each other. The Bab even comments that their whole point of going on pilgrimage has just been done because they're arguing so much. For nine days, there was no water there to drink lemon juice. Um, in the footnotes, it talks about how, how the, any deed done on water is worth twice that done on land which might seem like a bizarre thing. So if you're gonna do something good, if you're gonna help someone in this coronavirus, just stand in a bucket of water, you'll get double the blessings for it. But of course it's talking about because the conditions were so bad on the boat that I think, I think when you have real toil in trouble to do something nice is probably harder. Um, he then goes to Mecca and Medina. He, he comes across all the way along here. He gets off at Jeddah as we know, and then goes to Mecca and Medina. And that's, that's uh, predominantly what we're talking about there. And then certain lambs are sacrificed for this, for this uh, ceremony. And the Bab is now going on pilgrimage. The sign of God, God, God essentially is going on pilgrimage. It's, it's, it's crazy, this drama that's, that's slowly unfolding uh, before us. So when he's in Hijaz, when he's in the area of Mecca and Medina, what happens there? I've got a question before we start, is that okay? Sure. Um, um, apparently, I don't know, like, I've heard that the scroll that was written by the Bab and to, to be given to Baha'u'llah by Mullah Hussain, um, I've heard that there is a, that does exist and there's a translation of it. I, this is what I've been told. I don't know if, if anyone knowledgeable knows about this, but um, is that true or is that just rumors of some sort? I personally have, have never heard that. I don't know if anyone else has heard that. To, to, to my knowledge, um, we don't know what it was. We don't have it. Um, but if there's someone in the group that, that has any other information, but yeah, that's, that's the first time I've, I've heard that. To my, to my knowledge, no, we don't. We don't have it. Okay. Marianne, please. His visit to Hejaz was marked by two episodes of particular importance. The first was the declaration of his mission and his open challenge to the haughty Mirza Mukhti Kirami, one of the most outstanding exponents of the Sheikhi school, who at times went so far as to assert his independence of the leadership of that school 
assumed after the death of Sayyid Qazim by Haji Muhammad Karim Khan, a redoubtable enemy of the Babi faith. The second was the invitation in the form of an epistle conveyed by Qudus to the Sheriff of Mecca, in which the custodian of the house of God was called upon to embrace the truth of the new revelation. Absorbed in his own pursuits, the sheriff, however, failed to respond. Seven years later, when in the course of a conversation with a certain Haji Niyaz Baghdadi, this same sheriff was informed of the circumstances attending the mission and martyrdom of the Prophet of Shiraz. He listened attentively to the description of those events and expressed his indignation at the tragic fate that had overtaken him. The Bab's visit to Medina marked the conclusion of his pilgrimage. Regaining Jeddah, he returned to Bushir, where one of his first acts was to bid his last farewell to his fellow traveler and disciple, and to assure him that he would meet the beloved of their hearts. He, moreover, announced to him that he would be crowned with a martyr's death and that he himself would subsequently suffer a similar fate at the hands of their common foe. The Bab's return to his native land, Safar 1261, February to March 1845, was the signal for a commotion that rocked the entire country. The fire which the declaration of his mission had lit was being fanned into flame through the dispersal and activities of his appointed disciples. Already within a space of less than two years, it had kindled the passions of friend and foe alike. The outbreak of the conflagration did not even await the return to his native city of the one who had generated it. The implications of a revelation thrust so dramatically upon a race so degenerate so inflammable in temper, could indeed have had no other consequence than to excite within men's bosoms the fiercest passions of fear and of hate, of rage and envy. A faith whose founder did not content himself with the claim to be the gate of the hidden Imam, who assumed a rank that excelled even that of the Sahibul Zaman, who regarded himself as the precursor of one incomparably greater than himself, who peremptorily commanded not only the subjects of the Shah, but the monarch himself, and even the kings and princes of the earth, to forsake their all and follow him, who claimed to be the inheritor of the earth and all that is therein, a faith whose religious doctrines, whose ethical standards, social principles, and religious laws challenge the whole structure of the society in which it was born. Soon ranged with startling unanimity, the mass of the people behind their priests and behind their chief magistrate with his ministers and his government and welded them into an opposition sworn to destroy root and branch the movement initiated by one whom they regarded as an impious and presumptuous pretender. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you very much there. So uh, what are we dealing with? The Bab, um, he has gone on his pilgrimage. He's gone to Medina and Mecca. There's two events. There's two events that take place here that really stand out. One of them is his meeting with Mirza Mohita Kermani. Okay, not to be confused with Mirza Muppet. I don't want anyone to, to call him as Muppet. Mirza Mohit. <laughs> um, and uh, Mohit is, uh, has a very beautiful meaning, in fact. Um, so, anyway, so Mirza, Mirza Mohit Akhermani um, is one of the disciples of Sayyid Kazim. Okay, so he was a real disciple of Sayyid, Sayyid Kazim um, at the time. And, and the, the Bab, basically, who was also in, in some of the classes with Sayyid Kazim, the Bab spent some time there and was inside, was there with Sayyid Kazim. Um, they meet each other and the Bab goes up to him and he challenges him and the Bab from what I understand wasn't wasn't the tallest of of people he wasn't known for his for his height Mirza Mohit Akhermani however was um extremely tall and lean apparently 
Um, Mr. Sikh, my grandma would say, like a, like a kebab skewer, just standing up tall and, tall and thin. That's not a dawnbreaker thing, by the way. It's just my grandma. Um, so, so basically, he's standing there, and the barb goes up to him, and the barb says to him very clearly, he says, right, do you believe in, in, in my mission? And he holds him by the hand. So if you imagine this, this meeting with a slightly shorter guy and this very tall guy, and he's holding his hand, and he says, I want you to publicly accept or repudiate my truth. Mirza Mohita Karamani starts getting a little bit scared. He's like, uh, well, it, it, it's not that I don't, but the, uh, the, question, the, the questions, there's some questions that I need answering. And his holiness, the Bible says, fine. What are these questions? And he says, oh, well, well, I'll tell you them and, 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 and write them, write to me and, and maybe I'll believe. I'll probably believe. I mean, you, you seem great. And he's got fear. And he's, got, and he, he's being a bit of a coward. You know, does he accept the truth? Does he not? Bear in mind, accepting the truth of the revelation of the bar pretty much means certain death. This is this is almost the way it's going to go down if you're going to accept to to, to follow the bar. So what ends up happening is uh, he says, uh, "No, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to go. I'll stay around here. Write me a letter." The bar knows full well that he's not going to stay around, and the bar says, "Okay, I'll write you a letter. And if per chance you happen to not be in Mecca and Medina anymore, and you happen to just I don't know, for example, go back to Karbala." Um, I'll send the letter there. Of course, Mirza Muppet, sorry, Mohita Keramani goes back to Karbala. Um, and, and this guy comes up uh, again and again. And he's one of the three people that are, that are talked about when the signs of the barb are given, when people say, you know, he will be of medium height, he will uh, be free from bodily dysfunctions, all of these things. These weird sort of signs that, that when we talk about the barb, when Saeed Kazim sorry, talking about the barb, you're like, why is he describing the barb like that? But one of the reasons is because he knows that there are going to be people that are going to claim to be the position of the guy. Okay? And one of the things he's doing, he's ruling out Mirza Mohit because of his height. Anyway, that's one of the things that takes place. The second thing that takes place is this uh, epistle that's given to the Sharif of Mecca, um, which for seven years he decides not to read. Um, seven years later, we know that in a conversation with uh, Niyaz al-Baghdadi, um, he's like, oh, well, I never really read this, and I, I should have read this. This was, this was quite good. So we kind of missed out on that. So they're the two salient points. The Bab then returns back uh, from his pilgrimage. Um, he comes back to Bashir, and this is where he has, a, he has a conversation with Godus. And he says to Godus, the trip was awesome. Um, I promise that you are going to meet Baha'u'llah, essentially. Um, and he also says, we will never meet again. And you will suffer martyrdom. Um, the Bab's writings at this point have, have now started to, to spread, and a lot of people are falling in love and they're like wow what, what is this like how do we get to meet the bab who is the bab and then there's some people who are kind of yeah not very happy about it and it's raising the agitation the ecclesiastical order are very much against it with the bab's return to shiraz the initial collision of irreconcilable forces may be said to have commenced Already, the energetic and audacious Mullah Ali Bistami, one of the letters of the living, the first to leave the house of God, Shiraz, and the first to suffer for his sake, who, in the presence of one of the leading exponents of Shia Islam, the far-famed Sheikh Muhammad Hassan, had audaciously asserted that from the pen of his newfound master, within the space of 48 hours, Verses had streamed that equaled in number those of the Quran, which it took its author 23 years to reveal, had been excommunicated, chained, disgraced, imprisoned, and in all probability done to death. Mullah Siddiqui Kurasani, impelled by the injunction of the Bab in the Qasalis. <laughs> To alter the sacrosanct formula of the Adhan, sounded it in his its amended form before a scandalized congregation in Shiraz, and was instantly arrested, reviled, stripped of his garments, and scourged with a thousand lashes. The villainous Hussein Khan, the Nizamu Doli, Doli, the governor of Fars, who had read the challenge thrown out in the Khayyum Bul Azma, having ordered that Mullah Siddiq, together with Hudos and another believer, be summarily and publicly punished, caused their beards to be burned, their noses pierced and threaded with halters, 
Then, having been led through the streets in this disgraceful condition, they were expelled from the city. The people of Shiraz were by that time wild with excitement. A violent controversy was raging in the masjids, madrasas, the bazaars, and sorry about my pronunciation. No, not at all. Masjids referring to mosque, madrasas referring to, referring to religious schools. And other public places. Peace and security were gravely imperiled. Fearful, envious, thoroughly angered, the mullahs were beginning to perceive the seriousness of their position. The governor, greatly alarmed, ordered the Bob to be arrested. He was brought to Shiraz under escort and, in the presence of Hussein Khan, was severely rebuked and so violently struck in the face that his turban fell to the ground. Upon the intervention of the Imam, Juma, he was released on parole and entrusted to the custody of his maternal uncle, Haji Mirza Sayyid Ali. A brief lull ensued, enabling the captive youth to celebrate the Nauru's of that and the succeeding year in an atmosphere of relative tranquility in the company of his mother, his wife and his uncle. Meanwhile, the fever that had seized his followers was communicating itself to the members of the clergy and to the merchant classes and was invading the higher circles of society. Indeed, a wave of passionate inquiry had swept the whole country and unnumbered congregations were listening with wonder to the testimonies eloquently and fearlessly related by the Bob's itinerant messengers. The commotion had assumed such proportions that the Shah, unable any longer to ignore the situation, delegated the trusted Sayyid Yayi Darabi, surnamed Vahid, one of the most erudite, eloquent and influential of his subjects, a man who had committed to memory no less than 30,000 traditions, to investigate and report to him the true situation. Broad-minded, highly imaginative, zealous by nature, intimately associated with the court, he, in the course of the three interviews, was completely won over by the arguments and personality of the Bab. Their first interview centered around the metaphysical teachings of Islam, the most obscure passages of the Quran, and the traditions and prophecies of the Imams. In the course of the second interview, Fahid was astounded to find that the questions which he had intended to submit for elucidation had been effaced from his retentive memory, and yet to his utter amazement, he discovered that the Bab was answering the very questions he had forgotten. During the third interview, the circumstances attending the revelation of the Bab's commentary on the Surah of Qathar comprising no less than 2,000 verses, so overpowered the delegate of the Shah that he, contending himself with a mere written report to the court chamberlain, arose forthwith to dedicate his entire life and resources to the service of a faith that was to requite him with the crown of martyrdom during the Nairi's upheaval. Superb. Thank you so much. So we're going to go back a bit. When the Bab had, had come back, from pilgrimage. He then sends Godus and he sends him ahead and he says, I want you to go and teach Mullah Sadeg and, and my uncle the faith. Mullah Sadeg, who was he? He was a he was a he, he was a Mullah, obviously, and he would talk in the masjids, in the mosques, and he would stand on the pulpit and he would share his message, and people used to love him. The only thing is Mullah Sadeg was asked to add to the end of the Azan, end of the, the, the call to prayer. Um, this this verse, which is the Ali Gablo Muhammad, verily is the servant of the Bariat Allah. Ali Gablo Muhammad um, means the Ali before Muhammad. Okay, the word Gabl means before. So Ali before Muhammad is the servant of the Bariatullah, the remnant of God. Now the remnant of God refers to Baha'u'llah. The Ali before Muhammad, who is he talking about there? Well, when we look at the Bab's name, we know the acronym is Sam for the Bab. Sayyid Ali Muhammad, we see that Ali comes before Muhammad, which is the Ali Gablo Muhammad. So he says to Mullah Sadek to say this. Now Mullah Sadek, he stands up in his mosque and he starts saying this. 
Now he knows full well, by virtue of the fact that he's saying this, he's going to be met with nothing but a savage beating. It's almost blasphemous what he's doing, adding to this thing. You, you can't just add your own words to it. So he does this, and as a result, he's beaten and he's taken to the fort and uh, the governor's someone by the name of Hussein Khan. And Hussein Khan, from what I understand and the research, he was a bit of a womanizer, he liked to drink. Um, there was a couple of uh, strange things about him which I won't go into now, the habits he had. He basically decides to, to get Mullah Sadeh and to get Goddus as well and have them both beaten. He also burns their beards, which is very disrespectful. We all know the size of a beard is the size of your spiritual strength in some places. And then he has a halter put through his nose, a metal ring, which is an incision made through the nose, put through his nose, and then they're dragged around the streets. Not content with this, he then decides to go after the Bab, because in this document, the Gayo Malazma, the, the commentary on the Surah of Joseph, in there, the Bab writes how the authority should divest their power, the sovereign to the kings and the ruler, and, and that this is God's time to reign, essentially. So what they do is they, they call for the Bab. They're like, let's go and get the Bab. Let's send out for the Bab. So Hussein Khan from Shiraz sends out his, uh, his, his troops to basically go and get the Bab. And they start going along this route here, trying to go to the Bab, who's in Bandar Bashir. The Bab is walking towards them. As the Bab meets them halfway, the Bab says to them, huh, where are you guys going? And they say, oh, we're, we're going on some important business. We can't share with you. The Bab says, where are you going? And they say, well, we can't share with you. We're just going somewhere. And the Bab says, are you looking for, uh, for the Bab? And they're like, yeah, how did you know? And he says, I am the Bab. I am the Bab. You want me? I've come out to meet you to make it easier for you. Take me. And they're a bit confused. They're like, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to take you to Shiraz to see Hussein Khan, who we know he likes a bit of a drink. Go, go. And the Bab says, no, absolutely not. If he wants to see me, I'll see him. And they're really confused. They said, J just go, go. And he's like, no. They fall in love with him so much that they actually march back with the barb at the front, not like in chains and bound up. And then they get to Shiraz. They go to the fort and then they see Hussein Khan. Hussein Khan then asks a question. The barb returns with a quote from the Quran. Hussein Khan, not realizing it's a quote from the Quran, orders that the barb be struck across the face. He's hit so hard that his turban comes off. While his turban falls to the ground, somebody by the name of Sheikh Abu Tarab, who's a religious right-hand man, is, just says to him, no, 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 he wasn't being disrespectful. That's a quote from the Quran. Let's see what happens. Sheikh Abu Tarab, very randomly, by the way, for, for anyone who knows the, the group, The Prodigy, who are very big in the UK, a big rave group, The Prodigy, Keith Flint, um, his cousins are Baha'i. Anyway, the Barb's turban is, is then put back on. But they are very much worried and very much against the Barb. Some people are falling in love with the message of the Barb. Some people are getting very panicked. We then started talking about none other than Vahid. Vahid, whose name is Sayyid Yahya Darabi. This was the final thing we were talking about. Who was none other than the, uh, the, the wisest man in the country. I've been compared to Vahid. Um, compared to him, I'm not very wise, people have said. But, <laughs> so, he, so he was in Tehran, and uh, he was sent down by the king. The king said to Vahid, I want you, Vahid, because you're the smartest, you're the diamond, diamond guy. Go down and investigate. So, so Vahid goes down to Shiraz, and he goes to meet the bar. They have three interviews. Slowly but surely, Vahid realizes the greatness of the Bab. So much so that he gives, and he just says, at this point, I'm not even going back to the king. Imagine working for the king, being the highest guy. And he's just like, no, I found my new master. Um, we were talking about this third interview, where there's this commentary on the Surah Kosa, the Surah of Divine Plentitude, which is a fascinating Surah, which maybe we can go into later, that the Bab basically... In this third interview, he reveals this commentary um, that is no less than 2,000 verses. 2,000 verses, can you imagine? That's more than 1,500 verses. That's a lot of verses. So he basically puts this out, and Vahid is just blown away. Absolutely blown away. He who had firmly resolved to confute the arguments of an obscure seed of Shiraz, to induce him to abandon his ideas and to conduct him to Tehran, as an evidence of the ascendancy he had achieved over him, was made to feel, as he himself later acknowledged, as lowly as the dust beneath his feet. Even Hussein Khan, who had been Vahid's host during his stay in Shiraz, was compelled to write to the Shah and express the conviction that His Majesty's illustrious delegate had become a Babi. Another famous advocate of the cause of the Bab, even fiercer in zeal than Vahid, and almost as eminent in the rank, 
was Mullah Muhammad Ali Zanjani, surnamed Hujat, an Akbari, a vehement controversialist of a bold and independent temper of mind, impatient of restraint, a man who had dared to condemn the whole ecclesial hierarchy from the Abwadi Arbai down to the humblest Mullah. He had more than once, through his superior talents and fervid eloquence, publicly confounded his orthodox Shia adversaries. Such a person could not remain indifferent to a cause that was producing so grave a cleavage among his countrymen. The disciple had he sent to Shiraz to investigate the matter fell immediately under the spell of the Bab. The perusal of but a page of the Khoyom al-Asma brought by that messenger to Hujat sufficed to effect such a transformation within him that he declared before the assembled ulamas of his native city that should the author of that work pronounce day to be night and the sun to be a shadow, he would unhesitatingly uphold his verdict. Yet another recruit to the ever-swelling army of the new faith was the eminent scholar Mirza Ahmadi Azghandi, the most learned, the wisest, and the most outstanding among the ulamas of Khurasan, who, in anticipation of the advent of the promised Qa'im, had compiled above 12,000 traditions and prophecies concerning the time and character of the expected revelation, had circulated them among his fellow disciples, and had encouraged them to quote them extensively to all congregations and in all meetings. While the situation was steadily deteriorating in the provinces, the bitter hostility of the people of Shiraz was rapidly moving towards a climax. Hussein Khan, vindictive, relentless, and exacerbated by the reports of his sleepless agents that his captive's power and fame were hourly growing, decided to take immediate action. It is even reported that his accomplice, Haji Mirza Aghasi, had ordered him to kill secretly the would-be disruptor of the state and the wrecker of his established religion. By order of the governor, the chief constable, Abdul Hamid Khan, scaled in the dead of night the wall and entered the house of Haji Mirza Sayyid Ali, where the Bab was confined, arrested him, and confiscated all his books and documents. That very night, however, took place an event which, in its dramatic suddenness, was no doubt providentially designed to confound the schemes of the plotters and enable the objects of their hatred to prolong his ministry and consummate his revelation. An outbreak of color devastating in its virulence had since midnight already smitten above a hundred people. The dread of the plague had entered every heart, and the inhabitants of the stricken city were, amid shrieks of pain and grief, fleeing in confusion. Three of the governor's domestics had already died. Members of his family were lying dangerously ill. In his despair, he, leaving the dead unburied, fled to a garden in the outskirts of the city. Abdul Hamid Khan, confronted by this unexpected development, decided to conduct the Bab to his own home. He was appalled upon his arrival to learn that his son lay in the death throes of the plague. In his despair, he threw himself at the feet of the Bab, begged to be forgiven, adjured him not to visit upon the son the sins of the father, and pledged his word to resign his post and never again to accept such a position. Finding that his prayer had been answered, he addressed a plea to the governor, begging him to release his captive and thereby deflect the fatal course of this dire visitation. Hussein Khan ascended his request and released his prisoner on condition of his quitting the city. So we know the Bab, once he's taken, he's beaten, uh, what ends up happening, and again, and this is all taking place in none other than Shiraz. Um, he's, then, he's then basically in prison, he's under house arrest, he then has to go to this mosque, um, and, and these, are, these are details that the Guardian's left out in, in the dawn breaks, but he has to go to this mosque and basically say that he's not, um, he's not the gate to the hidden imam. So uh, it was very, if you remember, I told you we have the, the 12 Imams of Shia Islam. The, the 12th one is the one who went into hiding, um, who then, when he was in hiding, there were four gates who were talking to the 12th Imam. Once the fourth one passed away, um, or just beforehand, he said in the year 260, in the Islamic calendar, in a thousand years, this Ghaim will reappear. Of course, you went a thousand to 260, you get 1260, and that's the year 1844, when His Holiness the Bab uh, revealed 
who he was. He declared his mission. So what they think is happening is they think that the Barb's claim isn't to be the Ga'em, but they think the, the Barb's claim is actually to be the fifth gate that's communicating with them. So they say to the Barb, you must go to the mosque and you must stand up and say, I am not the fifth gate. Go on, we dare you to do that. We dare you. The Barb's like, yeah, that's, that's cool. No problem. So the Barb gets up and he goes up to the mosque and he says, Guys, and he starts speaking very eloquently, honest, um, obviously, and very eloquent. Uh, he, he starts, and then someone shouts at him, and, and they say, no, no, let him finish. And he says, I am not the fifth gate. And people are like, ah, oh, wow, he's not the fifth gate. Um, after this, there's so many people that are really in love with the Bab and what's going on, that it's, that it's said that possibly the Prime Minister, Haji Mirza Agassi, who's up in Tehran, is the one who colludes after hearing that, that Vahid has now believed um, because Hussein Khan had basically said to um, Haji Musa Agassi that Vahid now believe, believes that he's the one behind this thing in Shiraz that's basically saying to, um, that, that, that's come up with this plan to go and get the Bab. So the plan is they're going to go and kid the, kidnap the Bab. So it's a little bit mission impossibly. So this guy, um, Abdul Hamid Khan, is going along and I don't know if there's any music playing and he's decided to scale the wall and he's there with his men and he's like, right, I'm going in through the roof. He, uh, he gets his uh, rusari of, of all his friends or whatever, his headscarf, and then he scales down. He's like, da-da! And he sees the barber and he's like, got you! And he grabs the barber and he says, right, I'm taking you and we're going to go to Hussein Khan's house and there's going to be trouble. Only problem is, as they're coming out, they can hear these shrieks and these screams and people in the street all going kind of crazy. What's happening? What? Like, blah, blah, blah. And it's not coronavirus. It's cholera. Okay, and people are just people are dying left, right, and center. They're going crazy. People are not. Um, they probably should have been on lockdown. You know, they, they should have been doing all of that. They're not running around buying toilet paper. They're more sent. Um, but they're literally being. They're, they're dying off. So then he takes them. Abdul Hamid Khan takes the bab and he's like goes through the streets and he's looking at the right. He gets to none other than the um the house of the uh, he gets to none other than the house of the um, of Hussein Khan, only to find that Hussein Khan isn't there. He's like, well, I don't know what to do. I've now stolen the barber. I've got the barber. I've kidnapped him. He's not there. I don't know what to do. He then goes back to his own house, only to hear some shrieking coming from his wife. He finds out that his son is on his deathbed. At this point, he turns to the barber and he begs him and he says, if you're a holy man of any type, please do something. Help my son. He's dying. He's dying. The barber does his ablutions. Once he does this, he gives the water from his ablutions and says, give this to your son. The son drinks it miraculously becomes fine. This is then, this information is then uh, shared with Hussein Khan and he, Abdul Hamid Khan says, please look, look, I don't know who this guy is, let's not do anything. And Hussein Khan says, fine, okay, whatever, pass me another wine, I'm from Shiraz, I want to do this whole thing, but just get the barb out of it. It's at this point now, the barb is sent from Shiraz, he sent north up to Esfahan. Miraculously preserved by an almighty and watchful providence, the bar proceeded to Esfahan in September 1846. Accompanied by Syed Kazim of Zanjani, another lull ensued, a brief period of comparative tranquility, during which the divine processes which had been set in motion gathered further momentum, precipitating a series of events leading to the imprisonment of the bar in the fortress of Maku and Chirik, and culminating in his martyrdom in the barrack square of Tabriz. Well aware of the impending trials that were to afflict him, the Bab had, ere his final separation from his family, bequeathed to his mother and his wife all his possessions, had confided to the latter the secret of what was to befall him, and revealed for her a special prayer, the reading of which he assured her would resolve her perplexities and allay her sorrows. The first forty days of his sojourn in Isfahan were spent as the guests of Mirza Sayyid and Muhammad, the Sultan Lama the Imam Jomir, one of the principal alexasial dignitaries of the realm. In accordance with instructions of the governor of the city, Manichir Khan, the Muhammad Dawli, who had received from the Bab a letter requesting him to appoint the place where he should dwell. He was ceremoniously received, and such was the spell he cast over the people of that city, that on one occasion, after his return from the public bath, an eager multitude clamoured for the water that had been used for his ablutions. So magic was his charm that his host, forgetful of the dignity of his high rank, was wont to wait personally upon him. It was at the request of the same prelate that the barb one night after supper 
revealed his Roman commentary on the Surya of Al Asr. Writing with astonishing rapidity, he in a few hours had devoted to the exposition of the significance of only the first letter of that surah, and a letter which Sheikh Ahmad Asai had stressed, and which Baha'u'llah refers in the Kitab Aqdas, verses that equaled a number of third of the Quran, a feat that called forth such an outburst of reverent astonishment from those who witnessed it that they arose and kissed the hem of his robe. The tumultuous enthusiasm of the people of Isfahan was meanwhile visibly increasing. Crowds of people, some impelled by curiosity, others eager to discover the truth, still others anxious to be healed of the infirmities, flocked from every quarter of the city to the house of the Imam Jumair. The wise and judious Manchah Khan could not resist the temptation of visiting so strange, so intriguing a personage. Before a brilliant assemblage of the most accomplished divines, he, a Gregorian by origin and a Christian by birth, requested the Bab to expound and demonstrate the truth of Muhammad's specific mission. To this request, which those present have felt compelled to decline, the Bab readily responded. In less than two hours and in the space of 50 pages, he had not only revealed a minute, a vigorous and original dissertation on the noble theme, but also linked it with both the coming of the Qayyim and the return of Imam Hussein, an exposition that prompted Manchah Khan to declare before the gathering his faith in the Prophet of Islam, as well as a recognition of the supernatural gifts with which the author of so convincing a treaty was endowed. These evidences of the growing ascendancy exercised by an unlearned youth, the governor and the people of the city rightly regarded as one of the strongholds of the Shia Islam, alarmed the elasticity of authorities, refraining from any act of open hostility, which they knew full well would defeat their purpose. They sought by encouraging the circulation of the wildest rumors to induce the Grand Vizier of the Shah to save a situation that was growing hourly more acute and menacing. The popularity enjoyed by the Bab, his personal prestige, and the honours accorded him by his countrymen had now reached the high watermark. The shadows of an impending doom began to fast gather about him. A series of tragedies from then on followed in rapid sequence destined to culminate in his own death, the apparent extinction of the influence of his faith. Thank you, Pam. Thank you very much. So we have the Bab. He's up in Shiraz. He's, he then moves to Esfahan. When he goes to Esfahan, he stays in the, um, firstly in the house of Mirza Sayyid uh, Muhammad, who's the uh, Imam Jomay, basically one of the, the biggest Imam of the, of the town. He then moves to the house of Manushar Khan, who's the governor. And while he's there, Manushar Khan starts falling in love with him. This is a constant theme you'll find where the Bab moves and he's put in positions and people are meant to hate him and the rest of it. They start falling in love with his charm. There's also now growing talk about the miracles of the Bab that, that he could do, right? We know he gave his ablution water to the son of Abdul Hamid Khan, um, the, the person who'd kidnapped him. Well, now people are thronging after the Bab, trying to drink his ablution water and the rest of it. Now, of course, the Bab, th th this isn't the reason the Bab came to heal the sick through his waters through the miracles. In fact, we know that the Bab bans, the Bab is talking about his miracles. He's like outright bans it and says, you are not allowed to talk about the miracles because that's completely missing the point. The, the miracles are essentially the word, the transforming power that it has. So while he's there, he's asked to uh, do a commentary on this Surah of Valas. Um, and so, so to, to, to do this commentary, and it's actually, he writes about the, the first letter of this. And this first letter, the Bab ends up writing, ends up being a third of the Quran. Now the Quran has give or take six and a half thousand verses. So there's approximately 2,000 verses that are revealed purely on this. Um, and Manajah Khan is, is asking the Bab other questions and the way the Bab writes, the rapidity, remember, I mentioned before, six years of prophetic consciousness the Bab had. He reveals five million words. This is what we have digitized in Haifa. Okay, Baha'u'llah in a period of 40 years, six million. Now, not that Baha'u'llah couldn't reveal more, but it was so intense, the way in which the Bab re revealed it was just absolutely intense. So Manasha Khan starts absolutely falling for the Bab and, and wants to do anything he can. Of course, as we know, in the story, keeps, it keeps coming back and forth. Some people are very happy. Some people are falling in love because they're seeing the truth. Others, they see this as a threat. They see this as a divide, that, that their power might be divested. And, and God, what would happen if, they, if their power was taken away? Because that's what they're living for. 
the overbearing and crafty Haji Mirza Akazi, fearful lest the sway of the Bab encompass his sovereign and thus seal his own doom, was aroused as never before. Prompted by a suspicion that the Bab possessed the secret sympathies of the Muhtamid, and well aware of the confidence reposed in him by the Shah, he severely upbraided the Imam Jumeh for his neglect of his sacred duty. He at the same time lavished in several letters his favors upon the ulamas of Isfahan, whom he had hitherto ignored. From the pulpits of that city, an incited clergy began to hurl vituperation and calumny upon the author of what was to them a hateful and much to be feared heresy. The Shah himself was induced to summon the Bab to his capital. Manachir Khan, bidden to arrange for his departure, decided to transfer his residence temporarily to his own home. Meanwhile, the Mujtahids and Ulamas, dismayed at the signs of so pervasive an influence, summoned a gathering which issued an abusive document signed and sealed by the ecclesiastical leaders of the city denouncing the Bab as a heretic and condemning him to death. Even the Imam Jumeh was constrained to add his written testimony that the accused was devoid of reason and judgment. The Muhtamid, in his great embarrassment and in order to appease the rising tumult, conceived a plan whereby an increasingly restive populace were made to believe that the Bab had left for Tehran while he succeeded in ensuring for him a brief respite of four months in the privacy of the Imarat i Khurshid, the governor's private residence in Isfahan. It was in those days that the host expressed the desire to consecrate all his possessions, evaluated by his contemporaries at no less than 40 million francs, wow. to the furtherance of the interests of the new faith declaring his intention of converting Muhammad Shah, of inducing him to rid himself of a shameful and profligate minister, and of obtaining his royal assent to the marriage of one of his sisters with the Bab. The sudden death of the Muhtamid, however, foretold by the Bab himself, accelerated the course of the approaching crisis. The ruthless and rapacious Gurgin Khan, the deputy governor, induced the Shah to issue a second summons, ordering that the captive youth be sent in disguise to Tehran, accompanied by a mounted escort. To this written mandate of the sovereign, the vile Gurgin Khan, who had previously discovered and destroyed the will of his uncle, the Muhtamid, and seized his property, unhesitatingly responded. At the distance of less than 30 miles from the capital, however, in the fortress of Kinar Gird, a messenger delivered to Muhammad Big, who headed the escort, a written order from Haji Mirza Akazi, instructing him to proceed to Kulain and there await further instructions. This was shortly after, followed by a letter, which the Shah had himself addressed to the Bab, dated Rabbi Ul Tani 1263, March 19th to April 17th, 1847, and which, though couched in courteous terms, clearly indicated the extent of the baneful influence exercised by the Grand Vizier on his sovereign. The plans so fondly cherished by Monarchir Khan were now utterly undone. The fortress of Maku, not far from the village of the same name, whose inhabitants had long enjoyed the patronage of the Grand Vizier, situated in the remotest northwestern corner of Azerbaijan, was the place of incarceration assigned by Muhammad Shah on the advice of his perfidious minister for the Bab. No more than one companion and one attendant from among his followers were allowed to keep him company in those bleak and inhospitable surroundings. All powerful and crafty, that minister had, on the pretext of the necessity of his master's concentrating his immediate attention on a recent rebellion in Khorasan and a revolt in Kirman, succeeded in foiling a plan which, had it materialized, 
would have had the most serious repercussions on his own fortunes, as well as on the immediate destinies of his government, its ruler and its people. Thank you, Cynthia. That brings us to the end of that chapter. So what's happening here is that we're in Esfahan, the Bab is staying with Manasher Khan, and Manasher Khan falls in love with the Bab so much. There are people, the local, the ecclesiastical order, the, the, the religious people, uh, the religious leaders are not happy one little bit because they're like, this is, this is just a little bit too, too crazy. What's going on? And Manasher Khan turns around and says to the Bab, I, I'm in. <laughs> like, I absolutely feel what you're saying, your writings, they're so powerful and everything, and I want to help. In fact, I'm going to give you lots of money. And um, I'm going to have you marry a sister. And uh, this, the, um, he says, you know, I'm going to arrange this marriage with the sister of the Shah, I think it is. So he's, he wants to get uh, married to the sister of the Shah. And he says, let's, let's arrange this and uh, everything will be okay. And, and I'll pay. I'll give you loads of money. The Bob responds, thank you very much for your, for your kind words and your, and your offer. Actually, this isn't how the faith is going to spread. The, the tree of, of the faith will be... Uh, actually fed by the, the blood of the masses, by the people. This is how the message is going to be spread, not, not through, through these, grand, these grand ways. And he says to Manasher Khan, by the way, you're going to be dead in three months. Manasher Khan's like, what? But I was just being nice. And the Bible's like, no, it's not a threat. Don't worry. I'm just, just giving you a heads up. This is going to happen. Um, then, then we have uh, Gurkin Khan, who I believe is the, the, the nephew of Manasher Khan, who later on basically tries to cause loads of problems and, and tries to get the barb out and out the barb. And they're trying to sign this death warrant for the barb. Um, Manasher Khan comes up with this great plan to have the Bab escape at Isfahan, um, but then actually come back to his house. But that's in the dawn breaks, the details of that. We won't go into that. We know from here the Bab is going to leave. The idea is he's going to Tehran and he's going to go and meet the king. The Prime Minister, Haji Mirza Agassi, who we've previously said may be related to Andre Agassi, we don't know. But he's going and then they come to Kashan. As they get to Kashan, there's a man by the name of Haji Mirza Janiya Kashani. And he has this dream. He's sitting there, he, he has this dream and he wakes up and he says to his wife, he says, Shahre, Shahre, wake up, wake up. And she says, my name isn't Shahre, Zarin. He's like, sorry, sorry, okay, fine. <laughs> Zarin, that didn't happen, that's just my, my input. He basically says like, wake up. He's like, look, you have to make loads of food. You have to make loads of food. I had a dream, the barb's coming. She's like, not again, look, if you want more food, I've told you, you need to watch your, You're like, don't make things up. He's like, no, I promise you. I promise you that the barb is coming. And, and he says, I have this dream and, and I can see outside the city of Kashan, the Bab is coming and there's all these horses and, and he's there with his black turban and, and he's coming towards, and then all of a sudden she says, he's there with his what? And she says, he's there with his black turban. She says, the Bab is a Sayyid. We all know that Sayyid, descendants of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wear green. It must be a green turban, it can't be black. Hashim is a Jani Kashani, says, I, I, I can't tell you why, but it's black. He says, please, just make the food, and I'm going out to the city. He then goes to the gate to the city, outside the gate, while he's standing there, in the distance. He suddenly sees the dust rising. Through the dust, the horses are coming through, and he runs out. And there he meets none other than his holiness, the Bab. He falls to his feet, kisses his stirrups, the Bab pulls him back up, and they hug and embrace each other like they're intimate friends. The Bab had said in his dream that he was coming to stay for three days. This is why he told his wife to make the food, because he's going to have a guest. Lo and behold, he stays with him for three days. He then goes up and he goes via Gom. And then as he's getting towards Tehran, this is when there's interaction with the Shah. And this idea is born by Haji Mizar Agassi, who's terrified if the Bab meets the king, what might happen? So he then comes up with this plan, Haji Mizar Agassi. His cousin lives in a place up in the northwestern most part, in a place called Marku. So his cousin is actually the, uh, the governor of the prison of Marku, and he basically says to the king, look, we've got some business to attend to, why don't we send the Bab, like a holiday, to Marku? He can go and stay in this prison. Um, lo and behold, that's what's happened. The Bab is then taken to the first prison, to Marku, which is all the way up here. And that's where this chapter ends, and then we go on to to this next chapter. David, uh, can you hear me, boss? Can you hear me? Very well. Now, one small thing I wanted to contribute about this study. As we were doing the God Passes By, and indeed the Dawnbreakers with your kind self, the word that keeps occurring about these wonderful, you call them awesome, absolutely awesome events, the word that the beloved guardian uses, Dave, is providence, providence, providentially, that cholera came, providentially, this event occurred providentially 
the son was healed. It seems that in those six years, what you saw in this incredible ministry of His Holiness the Bab, the primal point, providence, operating at every level. Of course, the whole history of the Baabi Baha'i faith is the story of providence. But it's very noteworthy, as you read, and these wonderful, wonderful people, most of them the ladies who read, I, I kept looking at the word providence. Now, talking about providence, you've gone all there already to Kaushan, but in this beloved city of Esfahan, um, which of course I love very much because it's the birthplace of the king of martyrs and the beloved of martyrs, and the birthplace of so many luminous figures. In, it's in this same city of Esfahan during his stay that a particular host mentions that his brother doesn't have a child. And they beg, again, the providence of his holiness, the Bab, with his miraculous divine, divine power that he had. And of course, he showed his divinity right up to his martyrdom on the 9th of July. Could you do anything for my brother who is childless? And of course, His Holiness the Bab leaves a portion of his food to that gentleman. And he, he says, let your wife and your, yourself eat of it. And of course, this eventuates in the, in, the, in, the, in the realization and the birth of a lady who will subsequently be the wife of Abdul Baha and who's, who's in the monument gardens. The other thing that is remarkable in that period is, as you said, this incredible rapidity of his writings. Everywhere he wrote rapidly, but there in Esfahan, people saw it. It was absolutely as Dave, you said it. And then, of course, Surah Wal Asr. I have a copy of these surahs. I don't know, I'll pass away to the next world and leave them here. But anyway, they're all in the Holy Land, part of the five million words that are digitized. In the Surah Wal Asr, it's very interesting. That first letter, Dave, what is it? Vav. The letter, v. excellent. You are so with it, you know, you just, you're so aware. I mean, I have never, of course, in the period that I've been in Britain, I've seen as someone so enthused as your good self. The, the word va, when you write it longish hand in Arabic and Persian, it's called vav. So there is a W and then there is an Aleph and then there is another W. So the first wav refers to this 6,000 years of prophetic revelation the cycle of prophecy. So the Bab reveals this, and later on, His Holiness Baha'u'llah expands on it in the Agdas about the mystery of reversal. So the first valve is the 6,000 or so, roughly, of prophetic revelation leading to Aleph. Now the Aleph, as you know, Aleph stands erect on its own, dearest Dave. And so, of course, Aleph is the Qa'em because the word Qa'em means he who arises. In other words, he sort of, so that's the Aleph. But of course, the Aleph is followed immediately by another six years, by another Wav. And then Baha'u'llah and subsequently Abdul Baha and the Guardian say that of course that other Wav is 5,000 centuries of the cycle of fulfillment. So, this remarkable Surah of Al Asr revealed for the Imam Jum'e of Esfahan, who was very favorable and nice, as it were, in those days. So he was where there is the secret. Now, I just want, because your students are all very serious people, that same Imam Jum'e, Sultan al Ulama, when he passes away, this shows the human polarity that's more. This sort of man is the, the junction between good and evil. His brother then takes over the reign of ecclesiastical priestly authority. And who is his brother? The one who effectively causes the martyrdom of the king of martyrs and beloved of martyrs. And he's called the she-serpent in the epistle to the son of the wolf. He combines with the wolf. And of course, those twin, uh, twin martyrs are martyred. They're one of the... the 19 disciples of Baha'u'llah, the Sultan of Shahada, the King of Martyrs and the Beloved of Martyrs. This is an incredible class. Thank you so much. Are there any comments or questions 
uh, briefly before, because I'm aware people have uh, beds to get to and uh, tea to drink, because we're talking about tea. Um, any comments or questions before we before we leave, wrap this up? Dave, I'm going to send you my info uh, through the chat so you can to make sure I stay connected. Thank and you. can we pass this on to anybody? You can pass it on to absolutely anybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Fabulous. So yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. Um, do we have anyone that uh, that would that would like to share a, a prayer with us at all, please? I can do that. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord. This is a lamp lighted by the fire of thy love and ablaze with the flame which is ignited in the tree of thy mercy. Oh my Lord, increase his enkindlement, heat and flame with the fire which is kindled in the Sinai of thy manifestation. Verily thou art the confirmer, the assister, the powerful, the generous, the loving. 